Thank you. Um, today's prayer comes from the writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it is a prayer of gratitude. For flowers that bloom about our feet, for tender grass, so fresh, so sweet, for song of bird and hum of bee, for all things fair we hear or see, our creator, we thank thee. For blue of stream and blue of sky, for pleasant shade of branches high, for fragrant air and cooling breeze, for beauty of the blooming trees, our creator, we thank thee. Thank you. Amen. And I'll now request uh, for those of us who have something to drink, if you can kindly raise your glass. Alternatively, uh, if you can have your hand to your chest and we can raise a toast to the President of the Republic of Kenya. To the President. Thank you, and uh, with that, I will now request uh, visiting Rotarians to kindly introduce themselves. Uh, we have uh, uh, President Miriam from Rotary Club of Kisumu, Mashariki. Would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be with you and to fellowship with you to this afternoon. Thank you, you're most welcome. And uh, another visiting Rotarian we have is uh, past President Henry. Welcome. From Rotary Club of uh, Madhya Pradesh. President, President Ritesh, my good friend. Uh, it's a great joy to fellowship with you. Um, it's been many years since the fellowship with your club. And uh, looking forward to listen to my colleague, Mr. Matsu. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And uh, do we have any other visiting Rotarian? Uh, if not, we are going to go to uh, introduction of uh, guests. And the first uh, guest we have, uh, Ambassador Dr. Josephine, would you, would you like to introduce your guests? Thank you, President Ritech. Um, well, this is a surprise. I, I wasn't sure I would. I actually have only one guest today, mm -hmm. and uh, the guest is our keynote speaker. His name is uh, Dr. Mansour Saleh. He is the chair of the Department of Hematology Stroke Oncology and the founding director of the Aga Khan University Cancer Center in Nairobi. Um, Dr. Saleh has put together a very strong clinical and academic team there. And this afternoon, I know he's going to speak a little bit more on this. Maybe I can say how I met Dr. Saleh. I met Dr. Saleh when our re resource development committee led by Yusuf Keshavji got together to discuss the cancer care work that uh, Dr. Saleh has put in place. And I'm so happy that uh, he was available from this meeting to come and speak with us. Thank you so much. President Ritesh, fellow Rotarians and guests. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Dr. Josephine. Welcome, Dr. Sally. And uh, we are uh, going to have uh, an official introduction of our guest speaker in a few minutes. Uh, other visiting, uh, other uh, guests of Rotarians. Um, I have a couple of guests. Uh, my regular guest is, uh, actually there are two regular guests. One is uh, Shubrika. Welcome, Shubrika. Hi, Ritesh. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, the other is uh, Meera Pandit, the CEO of Asian Foundation. Welcome, Meera. Thank you so much. Uh, happy New Year to everyone. Very happy to be here and looking forward to the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any other uh, guests? Uh, Marilyn, would you like to introduce your guest? Um, thank you, President Ritesh. Uh, my guest today is Victor Okello. He is an architect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, welcome to all Rotarians and guests. And I will now move to announcements. And the first announcement we have is from uh, past president, uh, Mohammed Ali. Uh, 
Vice President Mohamed Ali. All right. Uh, whilst we wait for uh, him to connect onto audio, do we have any more announcements? So uh, there is an announcement in the chat from past President Mohammed Ali who says, good afternoon all, thank you so much for the support for the Jamhuri ablution blocks. In particular, past President Arun for negotiating the donation of sanitary fittings and tiles. This is a project which is underway uh, in order to mark the 90th anniversary of Rotary Club of Nairobi. Uh, at Jamhuri Primary School, we are actually constructing two sets of ablution blocks. One is for the physically challenged children and one is for the able-bodied children. And the work is going on very well and we congratulate the committee which is overseeing the works being carried out. So thank you so much. And uh, with that, uh, I will now um, read out an introduction of uh, uh, our guest speaker today. Dr. Mansour Saleh is the founding chair in the Department of Hematology and Oncology and the founding director of the Cancer Center at the Aga Khan University, Nairobi. The center works with faculty across other departments at AKU to support multidisciplinary research. Dr. Saleh received his medical degree from the University of Heidelberg in Germany and conducted his doctoral research at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg. He later on completed his clinical and translational research training in hematology and oncology at the University of Alabama Comprehensive Cancer Center, where he was a tenured professor of medicine and pathology and director of the first in human early drug development program. His area of research and clinical focus is targeted therapy for cancer. As founding director, Cancer Center, Dr. Saleh is developing a comprehensive research program that supports a range of research activities at AKU, including the establishment of an oncology clinical trials unit. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you all to please give a very warm uh, welcome to our speaker for today, Dr. Mansoor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you invited me last year, and uh, I was very grateful for the invitation. I've come back this year to give you a progress report, as I mentioned, but also to provide a proposal that probably would be of interest to the Rotarians. As I told you when I first talked to this group last year was, my first talk to the Rotarians was in a little town called Schleswig in Germany. It was my first talk in German, I was very nervous. I had it all written out. And recently I found out that I did bring those uh, papers with me. Obviously my writing was not good. I could not uh, read what I wrote, but I remember that uh, talk very well. Luckily this one is gonna be in, German, in English. Maybe if you'd ask me to say it in Swahili, it would be much more difficult, but I will do this in English. Um, I'll give you a progress report of what the Cancer Center has done over the past one year, including the COVID months we had, and then tell you about the science that we want to establish in this year and hopefully the next year. Innocent was with me, uh, who is my main navigator for the Cancer Center, who will run the slides for me and uh, we'll take it from there. So Innocent, you want to share the screen? Mm -hmm. Will the host allow me to share? Yes, yes, definitely. Just a moment. There we are. So this is uh, a presentation to the team um, and I'll give you a brief agenda of where I want to go next slide please. So I'll talk about the mission and vision of the Cancer Center. I'll talk about what we accomplished last year, what we plan to do this year and how I think Rotary could get involved as one of the projects you might envision for this year. Next slide. So this is Heidelberg. This is where I went to medical school somewhere down the road here in the middle of this place. This little bridge was bombed twice 
by the Germans because Heidelberg was a very important uh, town because it was a center for American forces in uh, Western Europe. And somewhere down here is where I went to medical school, same way where I learned German because most of my training was in Germany. But the most thing that I learned from Heidelberg was on the next slide. So in 1908, uh, Paul Ehrlich received the Nobel Prize. He worked at the Max Planck Institute in Germany at that time. He developed this antibiotic that we know today is an antibiotic called Salversan, was specifically for syphilis. And this was such that Salversan only attacked the syphilis bug and not the normal cell. So he called it a targeted molecule. He called it the magische Kugel, the magic bullet a bullet that only targets the enemy and spares normal tissue. And I was very impressed by that work. Next slide. Because at the Max Planck Institute, while I was working there, the Nobel Prize was given to these three individuals. The one in the middle, Heinz Kohler, was 40 at that time. He received the Nobel Prize for the development of these monoclonal antibodies. These are protein molecules that specifically target foreign antigens and the spare normal tissue. You probably have heard about monoclonal antibodies now because of COVID. We have monoclonal antibodies against COVID. One of the most famous or infamous person who got antibodies to COVID was the former President Trump. Uh, these are proteins that specifically, in his case, target the COVID spike protein and they only block the, the spike protein and nothing else. And these lead to destruction of the COVID uh, uh, virus. We have similar antibodies today that target cancer cells and specifically kid cancer cells. So while I was in Heidelberg, there's a lot about targeted therapy of cancer. So when I went to the US to do my residency uh, and then fellowship in oncology, my focus was targeted therapy of cancer, finding ways to really attack the disease and spare normal tissue, no hair loss, no nausea vomiting, etc. Next slide. So in 2011, here, not far away from where I sit, the Hisanesi Aga Khan, the Chancellor of the University, opened up the Heart and Cancer Center, and Mwai Kibaki was a president at that time. And next slide. And the Chancellor was very specific in saying that, at least in East Africa and in Sub Saharan Africa, the two things that are most shortly said, uh, sadly short changed. One was research, the other one was education. And his point was that if we were to premier research, it would provide excellent education that leads to better medical care. So my reason to coming down to East Africa was one, I was trained in research, I've been edu an educator, I am a clinician like most oncologists are, and we can do that together to provide a center of excellence that we housed here at AKU Nairobi in Kenya. Next slide. So the focus was research, education and training, fellowships, to train our young clinicians in Kenya to become oncologists, and then with clinical care, providing the best of clinical care so that we do not have to have patients to have to go to India, America, Europe, anywhere else, because 90% of what we need can be given here at home. Next slide. So the multidisciplinary approach is, rather than you going to a surgeon and then going to the oncologist or the radiation therapist, we establish service lines whereby if you came to us, or anywhere for that matter, for breast cancer, we'll have the breast oncologist, the radiation therapist, and the surgeon meet with you together and give you the entire pathway of care, and then you can help make a decision. Every major hospital, be it MP Shah, Kenyatta University, Nairobi Hospital, has what we call a tumor board, where you present a case, talk about it, and come up with a diagnosis and a treatment. What is missing there is the patient themselves. So we have a tumor board. We discuss all our breast cancer cases with the tumor board. But when we go to the multidisciplinary breast cancer clinic, which is newly established here at AKU, and meet with the patient, and she sees all the three doctors and the nurse, and she says, well, you know what you decided? You decided lumpectomy was best for me, but I don't want a lumpectomy. I cannot stand my breast because it remind me of my cancer. I want a mastectomy. All of a sudden, everything we talked about at the tumor board is thrown overboard. We have to reconfigure it. And I think that is the beauty of what we call a service line, whereby we have a multidisciplinary approach to every disease in malignancy. We begin with breast cancer, we'll 
use the same approach for colon cancer, and I talk about it, and then also for GYN cancer. So this is the approach the Cancer Center will have for future malignancy approaches here at AKU. Next slide. So the Cancer Center, besides providing clinical care, is going to be doing research. So on the left, you will see experimental therapeutics. We have a clinical research unit, and uh, Innocent will show you a little movie about our unit here. And then we will do clinical trials here. Because of COVID, we use that to train ourselves. We've not started any oncology trials, but during the COVID uh, lockdown, we trained ourselves, got certified in training. All the 15 staff are certified in clinical investigation. Our first research was in COVID pneumonia, severe COVID pneumonia. There's a drug called tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is an antibody, exactly what Heinz Kohler received the Nobel Prize for in 1984. That antibody blocks what we call the cytokine release. The cytokine release is exactly what happens in the lung that causes death. When you have the virus infecting the lung, the immune system now, in a way, attacks the virus. But when you have the immune system too robust, too active, too aggressive, it not only attacks the virus, it also attacks the lung tissue around the virus. That is what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. And the molecule that cause ARDS are cytokines, and this drug, tocilizumab, is an antibody that blocks cytokines. So we were the first one in Africa at that time, together with South Africa, to do this study. We enrolled about just a, under a dozen patients, the highest enrollment in Africa. We achieved a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine to show that tocilizumab was very effective for COVID-induced ARDS as long as the patient was not on a ventilator. We began with that. Our next approach was going to be a vaccine trial, hopefully for COVID. It was supposed to be in February. Now it's been moved to about March or April. The third approach to us will be in multiple sclerosis. We at AKU, together with two of our physicians and working with Kenneth University, have the highest number of multiple sclerosis African patients here in Kenya. Genentech would like to have a drug that we use in cancer to be used for multiple sclerosis. There's an antibody that blocks a specific target that has been shown to be 80% effective in Caucasian for multiple sclerosis. We want to test this drug in African Americans and in Caucasians, but they've done that. We would like to do it in Africa. My premise has been that we should test drugs on the African population before we have big pharma sell drugs to us for our particular, particular market space. So we have a study coming up for multiple sclerosis. We are uh, to enroll about 30 to 50 African patients to test this antibody to see if it's effective. Something that we did that nobody else is in Africa, as you well know, and, I, and it's, although I'm an oncologist, I've become sort of a COVID expert a little bit, but I'll come to cancer very shortly because that's, my, that's the only thing I know to do. But as I told you, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, is caused by the immune system in the lung attacking the lung. The virus in the meantime has disappeared, has been killed, but the immune system is very active causing this ARDS, which is why people go on the ventilator. A team at Emory University in Atlanta, where I went to uh, get some training as well, had shown that a low dose of radiation to the lung can attack the immune system without affecting the lung tissue. It's a hundredth of a dose that we give for lung cancer. So they published a paper with 10 patients to say, low dose radiotherapy, effective to kill the immune response in the lung only, does not affect the lung tissue, their 10 patients, median age was above 75. Eight of them left the hospital within a week. The other two left the hospital two weeks later. None had to be ventilated. So we said, well, low dose radiotherapy is very cheap compared to tocilizumab, which costs $3,000. A night in the ICU costs nearly $1,000. So why not low dose RT? So we wrote a, a, a trial here, approved by PPB, Nacosti, our own IRB. We are giving low dose radiotherapy to severe COVID pneumonia in patients in order to avoid for them to go into a ventilator. We've enrolled eight patients so far on the prevent uh, cohort and we're waiting to enroll more on the on vent cohort. And to give an example, patients are on ventilator who have no other options, we were hoping to give them radiotherapy. 
but the mobile ventilator that we have that we use to transport the patient from the ICU to the RT unit could not give the high pressure oxygen to our patients. So we could not uh, enroll anybody on a ventilator. Just recently, and Henry would know, that the ICU has purchased ventilators that are mobile. So a patient in the ICU can use his own ventilator. We just have to move him and the, and the ventilator to the RT unit. We apply the same pressures as he was getting in the RT unit, and we can irradiate him or her for that matter. So we'll be using Global's RT to our ventilator patient. Our numbers are going down, but I believe there will be a surge coming. So LDRT will be clearly something we can do for our patients here. And if it works well, I think we'll expand it to other places that have radiation therapy units. Clearly much effective, not very expensive, not lethal, and I think will be really helping quality of life for patients. So this is what we've done in the clinical research unit at the AKU, but I want to move towards cancer one of these days, but we will. In addition though, we have a genomics program. If you look at breast cancer, the gene is responsible for cancer, but we do not test the gene of the patient's tumor to determine what are the genes that are upregulated and are cancer causing. So we will have a program in 2021 where every breast cancer patient will have the tumor tested, genetically elucidated. We can identify what is the upregulated gene, and we can block that gene with medication, with antibodies or other targeted molecules. So that's an important uh, factor. The next program we will have, probably not in 2021, but maybe 2022. 20% of women who have aggressive triple negative breast cancer have a hereditary form of breast cancer. Angelina Jolie, for example, had double mastectomies because her mother had breast cancer, her grandmother had breast cancer. She has a BRCA mutation. But there are 25 hereditary mutations that we know about for breast cancer, but we don't test them. We don't ask you about your family history. When you tell you that my mother had breast cancer and my aunt had breast cancer, we say, okay, we'll draw a family tree, but we do not make it actionable. The genetics program of the cancer center will do that. We'll look at the family tree, identify the genes that have been transmitted to you from your family, let you know what your risks are, and then also help your family prevent the cancers that may be preventable because of such genetic mutation. And then we have a women's cancer program in population science. But these three things, experimental therapeutics, genomic medicine, and genetics, will be something we'll be doing very soon. Genomics this year and genetics next year, hopefully a little bit earlier if we can do that, because this is the approach to cancer care. Next slide. So I showed this slide last time. It's a daily nation saying cancer research from the West will not work in Africa. It's partly true because our genetic makeup is different. We use chemotherapy at a lower dose than the Caucasians do because it is very toxic to our patient. Our patients do not tolerate it. When you reduce the dose to ameliorate toxicity, do we know that we are probably reducing the efficacy? We've never tested that. So the clinical research unit, which is the unit that we've developed here, will be asking the questions. What is the efficacy as well as toxicity of the drugs that we use in Africa that we've taken from North America or Europe? So the CRU of the Cancer Center at AKU is dedicated to research on our patient population so that we know that we can serve them well with the drugs that we have. Next slide. So this is the CRU opened up by uh, Deputy Minister Rashid. This was about in October. Um, the dignitaries were here. I was missing uh, uh, Yusuf Kashafi, who was your representative uh, at, the, at this opening because Yusuf was away. And I think I have a brief video to show you what our unit looks like. This is the uh, forum. We have a fish tank. Every Rotarian can uh, name a fish after them for a small donation. <laughs> These are exam rooms. <laughs> this is where we give our therapy.
conference room. Conference room. This is the office where you see me. So this is a CRU. It is specifically dedicated to patients who come for clinical research. So we will be at Kenyatta University, Nairobi Hospital, AKU, anybody eligible for a clinical trial will come to the CRU to get their treatment. And this is where we have trained staff. But let me show you why we think we are different than others. If you look at this, this is a hot uh, map of genes of breast cancer tissue. So on the left, you see tissue from Caucasian women from Alabama. On the middle, you see breast cancer tissue from Kenyan women from AKU. On the right, you see tissue from African-American women with breast cancer from Alabama. So we're trying to compare our genes. Blue is cold, which is down-regulated. Red is very hot, up-regulated. And you can see very quickly up there in the front, in the middle, you have in the Kenyan women in the middle, hot spots, up-regulated genes that you do not see in the Caucasian women on the left, nor do you see them on the right in the African-American women. We certainly have certain genes that are turned on in an African woman, in a Kenyan woman with aggressive breast cancer that are not present in the Caucasian or the African American. Next slide. Same thing here. Look at the middle row, which is Kenyan women. You see the middle here is orange and blue, down regulated. The same genes are up regulated in the African American on the right and the Caucasian on the left. So there clearly is a difference between our breast cancer genetically than the breast cancer in North America or Europe for that matter. Our job in the CRU is to identify those genes and then target that treatment specifically for the woman who has this genetic makeup. That is the important part. But first we have to do sequencing. So Henry, you want to mute? Sorry. Starting 2021, every breast cancer tissue coming to AKU will be sequenced. We'll have a heat map like this, looking at the genetic scheme screen to determine what are the upregulated genes so that we can block those for better treatment. Next slide. So this is how you get a CAT scan. You sit into this tunnel and the CAT scan slices you with x-rays every five millimeters of your body. Next slide. It gives you these slices. So these are five millimeter slices to your body. You can see the spleen, the gallbladder, et cetera. Typical way of identifying malignancies within a body. It's not a good, very good screening tool, but it's at least when you have symptoms of malignancy, when you have a big mass, we can identify where is it, what's happening. Next slide. On the left, you see a CT scan. You see the left, there's a breast mass here. The mass could be TB, could be infection, could be a tumor. We have a PET scan. The right side you see is a PET scan. A PET scan gives you radioactive glucose. Any malignancy, because it's growing very quickly, will take up radioactive glucose and show up as hot. So what you see on the scan on the left as being a mass, we know now as a result of the PET scan that this is a malignant mass. And that is the power of a PET scan. Next slide. Look at this. This is what we did at, in Alabama. On the left screen, on the left side, you see a patient. PET scan shows multiple tumors. These are melanomas. This is aggressive skin cancer. In the liver, in the lung, in the bones. Look at it. Two weeks later, getting one pill a day. All the malignant cells have disappeared, have died. The only hot spot is the heart, where we see the blood. The brain, because the patient's thinking all the time, it picks up radioactive glucose. And the bladder, where you are excreting the radioactive glucose we gave you. But within two weeks, the power of targeted therapy that we can go from massive disease to near complete remission. We have this drug here, we use it here. We do not have melanoma in Africa, but this is the power of targeted therapy. Next slide, the same, next screen the same way. You've got this patient with multiple bone lesions. Every bone is studded with yellow, red, green spots because of malignancy. In the pelvis, in the femur, in the ribs, and the sternum. Two weeks later, look at this PET scan. It is nearly negative. 
this is what I trained to do. This is targeted therapy of cancer. This is what we need to do and would like to do here in Kenya. Next one. So where do we go from here? Progress will come through innovation. So we plan to have a stem cell transplantation and cellular therapy program. And I'll tell you a little bit about it. This is where you can rescue patients with aggressive tumor. You give them aggressive uh, chemotherapy, which will ablate their bone marrow, but you rescue them with a new bone marrow from a sibling or somebody else. Or you can take your own cells, which are inefficient to fight your cancer, reprogram them, give them back to you to fight your cancer. And I'll show you an example. We'll also have a, what we call a innovations, medical education innovations unit. We will be able to have physicians and residents be able to work on a dummy, a virtual model of a patient through simulation to be able to do what they will do future on a patient. So we don't have to poke the patient, we learn on the simulation model and then we go to the patient. The biggest thing though, however, medical breakthrough will come from scientists, clinicians, but practice change and improvement in quality care will come from educated nurses and doctors. So we would like to train our doctors to become investigators like me, but also train our nurses to become really profoundly educated in that one field where they take care of a patient. And finally, my statement is, we can save lives by cancer prevention and early detection. This is where I want to have a proposal to the Retellians. Next slide. So look at this. On the left, you see this patient. Maybe the biggest, the most effective cell in your immune system that would fight cancer is a T cell. Same thing with COVID. T cells attack COVID viruses. The same T cells attack cancer cells. The problem is your cancer cell camouflages itself as if it's normal. So the T cell cells don't kill this guy, it's part of cell. Secondly though is your tumor produces inhibitory molecules that inhibits your own T cells. That's how tumors escape immune surveillance. So one way to do this is use monoclonal antibodies to block those inhibitory molecules and we have immunotherapy. The second thing to do is take your T cells that become impotent in a way to fight your cancer. And on the right, you will arm them with new molecules genetically. So now you have this T cell that is armed against your specific tumor. And you will take these T cells here, grow them in the laboratory, give them back as a blood transfusion back to the patient. We call this CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor activated T cells. These are your own T cells. You will take out in the laboratory, make them into arm T cells and give them back to you. We have the technology. It is not existing in Africa, not even in South Africa. The cellular therapy unit of the AKU Cancer Center will do this in the next year or two. Next slide. This young girl, this is a picture taken from New York Times. It was nearly about 10 years ago. She was about 12 when this picture was taken. Next slide. When she was five, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, she had acute leukemia, had received a bone marrow transplantation, which had failed, and she was ultimately probably destined to die because if you progress after bone marrow transplantation, the survival is three months. So her name is Emma Whitehead. Emma Whitehead was the first patient, uh, previous slide, uh, in previous slide, the one before. We took, well not we, the team at uh, UPenn took Emma Whitehead's T cells that were not attacking her old leukemic cells. They made them into CAR T cells and gave them back to Emma as a blood transfusion. Next slide. And next slide. This uh, go back. young Emma was five years old. Today is 16. She was cured because of cellular therapy. We can do the same thing for acute leukemia, for breast cancer, for lung cancer. We have the technology. We have the knowledge. We will be able to do this in 2022 here at AKU, not just for patients at AKU, but for the entire population in Kenya. And that is a commitment that the Cancer Center has to say we will be like 
any other North American center because we can do this with innovation. Next slide. So you see on the right, there is the university center. Up there, there are 12 floors. Somewhere on the ninth or the 10th floor will be the cellular therapy unit that will do exactly what was done for Emma Whitehead. We'll do it for Kenyan patients. But we, able to be, we, we have to be able to have the knowledge, the technology, but also the experience. So the CRU is dedicated to doing that, to training our physicians to be able to give CAR T cell therapy. Next slide. So this is a simulation center. This is an AKU Karachi. At AKU Karachi, you've got about 20 dummies. Every dentist works on the teeth of these dummies, very much like live patients. They will complain when they perceive pain. They will bleed when you uh, drill too hard. And you train on them before you go to the patient. Top right, you deliver a baby on this mannequin, very virtual. It spews out amniotic fluid. It spews out a baby who's crying. The blood pressure of the mother of the baby you can test before you deliver a baby. This is what we do to train you. When I trained in Germany a long time ago to do uh, one month of midwifery, you have to wait at the OB uh, clinic. When the woman delivers, you're called very quickly to hold the baby before she comes out and you pass the test and say you delivered a baby. I've never delivered a baby since then. I don't think I could deliver a baby because I didn't do it right. In Karachi, we do the stimulation before you can go and deliver the baby. Look at this, the OR, cardiac catheterization, same thing, simulation. And the left hand side is, for example, simulation of a patient. This patient's pneumonia has exactly the lung sound of a pneumonic patient. This simulation is coming to AKU, Nairobi, on the unit that I show you, on the uh, university center, on the 11th floor. 11th floor will be simulation center. So we'll be able to practice on virtual models that are very human before we go to patients. Next slide. So, uh, so the last two slides are going to talk about a project I want to propose to Rotary. This is colon. Stage one colon cancer is this little pink mass, uh, pink mass, which is a very early tumor on the left hand side, stage zero. It has not even invaded into the tissue lining of the colon. It is stage zero. When the surgeon removes that, the curate is 100%. But you can only do that, can we identify that with a colonoscopy, obviously, or detection. Look at the tumor stage one. The stage one tumor now has gone to the lining of the colon, but has not come out on the other side. It's stage one. If you pick up stage one colon cancer, curate is still 100% because it has not spread outside of the bloodstream. Stage two is now at the edge of the lining. Maybe a risk of about 20% of having spread. If you remove this, the curate is 80%. Stage three, disease has spread to the lymph nodes and most likely in the bloodstream. Your curate, even if you remove the tumor, is down to 60%. And if you have stage four, where the disease has escaped into distant areas, Curate is 15 percent. Colon cancer is best cured either by prevention, which we can talk about it during the Q&A, or early detection, colonoscopy. And I can venture to say that 90 percent of Rotarians, just like 90 percent of Kenyans, just like 80 percent of Americans, have not had a colonoscopy in their life. And when you get to the age of 50, you have a colonoscopy. If you see any of these lesions, you take them out. Your curate is very high. If you have a polyp, which is pre-malignancy, you take it out, it will not become cancer. Yet we do not do early detection. So, next slide. March is the colon cancer month. Colon cancer is one of the top five cancers in East Africa. So what I'm going to propose, I just had a call in preparation for this uh, session with the University of Michigan. The colleagues at the University of Michigan are probably one of the top five centers in America in terms of colorectal surgery and predictive models. They've agreed to come down to uh, Kenya. They'll be all vaccinated by that time. So they will take their flights. They will educate us. We'll provide screening, which will improve survival by nearly 50%. So working with the team at the University of Michigan, team at AKU, we would like to do a screening study. Now, we can't go to the population because my problem is if we identify a tumor and you have no ability to pay for colonoscopy or for the surgery, I think that is going to be detrimental. 
So we have to do a pilot. So we decided to do a pilot. We can go to a big, uh, couple of big firms that have thousands of uh, employees and see whether we can screen them. But we could do even a small pilot where I could offer to say that a small micro pilot would be offered to the Rotarians of Nairobi or of Kenya for that matter. We'll educate you, slides, models. We'll talk about cancer and then we'll do a screening for your membership. And the screening will include what we call a fit test, fecal, non-invasive genetic testing. We're a very small stool sample. Can test for tumor DNA. If your stool sample is tumor DNA, you've got a 98% likelihood of having colon cancer. If it's negative, you're most likely scot free. It's a very non-invasive, not a colonoscopy, not a stool test where you do look for blood because when you eat meat, etc., the fecal or cult blood test will be, will be false positive. It's FIT, which looks at specific genes that are falling down from the tumor into your stool, where we can detect. The team from Michigan will be able to do this test for us. So that was my last slide. Uh, if the Rotarians want to take up on it, March is coming up very soon. We can do this very quickly. Education, awareness, and cutting edge screening. I think this will be the first Rotarian group in the world that has ever done this. So that was my last slide, I think. Is it right, Ines? Yeah. So I will end there and I will unsh unshare my screen. Thank you, Doctor, for this wonderful presentation and the proposal. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful proposal. Thank you. And uh, I believe we can take some questions. Um, uh, we have received a number of questions, actually. The first one is from uh, Professor Michael Hopkins. Dr. Michael, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Oh, sorry. I, I thought you were going to do all the work for me, Ritesh, uh, President Ritesh. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, Dr. Mansour, I am absolutely flabbergasted with your, the quality of your presentation and your work. I, I'm absolutely impressed. And congratulations for being there and for, for all of us. I, I, I have two uh, quick, rather naive uh, questions. I, I'm a, a professor of totally useless. I just, I just know about economics, um, so I, not not as useful as as, as your work. Unfortunately, I, I wish I were. About two questions. One is you did mention COVID. I was wondering, as you were speaking, whether any of the techniques that you you've uh, using could be used to prevent death in COVID. And I wonder what was the leading cause of death in COVID today, maybe that's outside your, your sphere of knowledge, but I wonder whether uh, you would know that and therefore it looks at like the, the techniques that you've got that you could understand to a layman like me um, what, what, what the main cause of death would be and then how to go about preventing it. And my, my second uh, 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 question was, um, uh, Hang on, I wrote it down. I've now forgotten what it was. It's stupid me. You see how we professors can't remember what we're thinking about half the time. Just a sec. Uh, uh, yes, yes, on colon cancer. Uh, I've actually had a colonoscopy and I do it every couple of years. Um, but what, what you mentioned, I'd never heard that before, preventative measures that one can take to prevent colon cancer. Could you just tell us in a few simple words that you would like and understand what sort of preventive measures you would suggest? So my two questions, one is on COVID and the second on colon cancer. And thank you very much for being with us and, and actually being here for humanity. Thank you. Sure, thank you. You know, ultimately money counts. So we need people like you. Uh, we can talk a lot, but without the economic where we all to sustain this in some way, we would be nowhere. So I think it takes a village to get it done. So we know, if you take 100 people, 80 patients who get infected by COVID will be asymptomatic. And they will have a sniffle, maybe a little bit of aches, would not even think about it, would go home, life goes on. 20% become symptomatic, come to the ER, have to be admitted because they have low oxygen. Of those 20%, we give them steroids, we give them fluid, we give them oxygen. Half of them will do well within two weeks and go home. So we're left with 10%. Of those 10%, oxygen and steroids are not sufficient, they will end up in the ICU. And those that end up in the ICU require, in the meantime, 
you either have a fulminant viral infection, so you need something to fight the virus. So this cocktail that Trump got was antibody to fight the virus. Different targets on the virus can be attacked by this particular cocktail of antibody. So that's one to kill the virus. But the main cause of death is not the virus anymore. It is the inflammatory immune response to the virus that scars the lung. This is why you need to be intubated, given high oxygen. So if you could stop the immune system from being overactive in those 5% of patients who die, we would be winning. So tocilucinate is an antibody that blocks this immune repertoire. Low-dose radiotherapy does it as well. So the number of molecules today that are being used to suppress the immune repertoire from overactive to scar the lung. The trouble is, we can't give it prophylactically, it's too expensive. We sometimes give it too late, too late. So I think if we knew how to do it in between, if we had markers to say, here's a canary in the coal mine, if you get this plus that mm -hmm. blood test going up, you should give the patient low-dose radiotherapy to inhibit the immune repertoire or give them tocilucinab, we'll be ahead of the game, but we are missing those molecular markers. We know exactly what causes death. We just cannot intervene in a timely fashion because we do not know who are those 5% in whom to intervene because otherwise it's very, very expensive. Tocilucinab that we use two doses is nearly $10,000, nearly unaffordable. So I think we need to come up with some way to identify who should be the one to receive the medication for 10K so that it's cost beneficial. So we save the others from all the expenses. Colon cancer, we know today that obesity is a causative factor for breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. It has been shown categorically. But we have to become non-obese early on. So our diet is very critical for two reasons. One, it reduces obesity, but more importantly, our diet results in microorganisms in the colon that themselves produce genes and impact the environment of the colon. It's called the microbiome. The African microbiome is fantastic. It's very healthy. But if I look at Innocent who's sitting in front of me and my team here, when they have 30 minutes to go for a quick lunch, they go to Captain D's or one of those American outfits here. That diet is not good for your microbiome. So we know a way to things to prevent it. And finally, I started taking low-dose aspirin since I was 21. It was a long time ago. Because we thought low-dose aspirin, because it blocks certain microenvironmental factors, will protect from heart disease and cancer. Today we, today we know that low-dose aspirin does not protect from heart disease, but it does protect from colon cancer and prostate cancer when taken consistently but can only be, should only be taken by those who do not have a bleeding predisposition because otherwise you get significant bleeding. So there are a number of preventive things we can do, but they have to start very early. Too late for me to start today has to start in the adolescence in terms of dietary and chemopreventive measures. I think, I wish you were my doctor, Kevin. <laughs> I hope I can call you one day and I, well, I hope I don't need to, but thank you very much and I hope uh, everybody's learned a little bit from what you said, especially this issue of aspirin, which is a huge issue. And we've recently been advised not to take aspirin so, uh, for the, some of the reasons that you, you've mentioned as well. You've, you've shown us how complicated it is. It's far more complicated than economics. I, 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 I can see why I stayed with economics. It's pretty simple compared to what you're doing. Anyway, many congratulations and thank you very much for a beautiful presentation. I hope uh, Rita, show, that it's been recorded and that we, we can actually study it again because I'm not sure I understood everything that, that, that you said because you covered a lot, of, a lot of ground very brilliantly. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Ritesh. Good afternoon, Vice President Elizabeth. Thank you very much for a good speaker. I think very informative, but I just had something. Did he say that we shouldn't take aspirin or we yeah. should take aspirin? You shouldn't take it willingly because the risk of aspirin causing bleeding is much higher than chemo prevention. Okay. And so I would go to the doctor first to be sure that you do not have a bleeding diathesis because otherwise it's what causes more trouble than the chemo prevention part of it. So I would say, even though it's a low dose, 
The full dose is not beneficial because it's too much. The low dose, even the low dose can cause bleeding, etc. So it is more harm than beneficial if taken willy-nilly, number one. Number two, if taken, has to be started very, very early. I think most of us Rotarians, or most of the Rotarians that I see here, I think we may have passed the age because you take it even before you get the stage one colon cancer. It's decades before you develop a cancer. It takes, on the average, seven to 11 years for one cell that is malignant to become cancer 11 years later. So criminal prevention is to start very early on, yeah? Okay, so Dr. Mansour is just that applicable to somebody who is suffering from cancer or just us normal people the way we take aspirin you know you advise with doctors that you should take it to avoid any clotting you know like that can lead to heart attacks or anything like that so we know and i would i want to be sure that i don't i'm not advising people to take aspirin it has not been shown to be beneficial for heart disease we thought it was because it was a blood thinner it would help the arteries not clot we know today it is not beneficial Heart disease. Oh, wow. Once you have heart disease, maybe then they, the doctor might give you, the cardiologist will give you a blood thinner and maybe plus minus aspirin. But as a preventive agent, it was not beneficial thanks to research and it was clearly detrimental. We know today that on meta analysis with millions of patients, those in the, in fact, it started the women's health study, there were nurses where nearly three or four decades ago were uh, surveyed for nearly 40 years. What do you do? What do you take, et cetera? We realized from that nursing study that low dose aspirin is beneficial for certain diseases, but not for heart disease, possibly for breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer, but only for those in whom they were tested initially to be sure there was no bleeding diathesis. Because if you use it, and my kids use it, for example, my daughter cannot because she has had immenses that become very bad. So my son uses it because he is protected, does not have any of the big diathesis. diathesis. But he began at the age of 20. So I would say that for today, not start, talk with the doctor first. At least for Thank you, Dr. Mansour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Mansour, can I please request um, if we can have the vote of thanks first from Ambassador Dr. Josephine. And thereafter, I'll request you to stay on just for 10 minutes longer as we have some more questions in the chat box. Is that OK? Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Dr. Josephine, uh, kindly, if you would give a vote of thanks to our speaker for today. Thank you very much, President Ritesh, fellow Rotarians and guests, for allowing me to pass a vote of thanks on behalf of us all. Professor Saleh, at the outset, we want to thank you for dedicating your life to improving the health of Kenyans through the Aga Khan University Teaching Hospital. We know that you've come back home of your own volition to contribute to improving health services in this setting. And for that, we want to really acknowledge and appreciate you. You are indeed a star oncologist. Cancer is indeed, like you said, the third highest cause of death in Kenya, but you have also brought to our attention the high registration of morbidity due to colon cancer. And you've also reached out to us and asked if Rotarians would take up this offer in March to be involved in an activity on colon cancer. I'm sure we will. And also the offer and also, if I may, on the CART cell uh, program. I need to let you know our club, the Rotary Club of Nairobi, is represented at the Rotary District Health Team level in the Cancer Care Project. Actually, the person who leads cancer care for Kenya is a member of our club and her name is Anne Van Lawe. I know she's not on the call today, but we let her know because you're in the right place for Rotarians, not just of our club, but within the country to respond to the two offers that you have given us. I just want to let you know that we're actually very honored and excited to have listened to your talent, your experience, and to have felt the enthusiasm and the vision that you put into your work. In summation, you are providing hope for cancer care. Hope in very many areas. You've talked about the training and research, clinical trials, linkages to COVID-19, vaccine trials, LDRT. You've also told us about genomics, 
And now we are happy that the African populations will be better represented in cancer clinical trials with this innovation around genomics. You're brought to our attention, stem cell therapy, and also the innovation that educated doctors and nurses can bring to cancer care. You've mentioned also dietary factors and lifestyle, which all of us can identify with. I want to say that your presentation to us is definitely the way forward for bridging gaps in the provision of cancer care in our setting. So while there are still challenges ahead, we recognize that you're doing lots of good work and bringing hope to many patients and many families. We want to thank you. We look forward to visiting you when it's easier, when we can walk through the hospitals, not to worry about physical distancing, but even having said that, we still will take up the offer for March. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and all the very best as you continue to do your noble work at the Aga Khan University Teaching Hospital based in Nairobi, but with an impact in East Africa and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Dr. Josephine, uh, who is also our Vice President and President nominee. Uh, thank you for this wonderful vote of thanks for our exceptional speaker today. And uh, Doctor, uh, there are a couple more questions which have come in. One is from uh, Victor Kenneth, and he asks, how do the mannequins work? It's amazing. How can we measure vitals on the mannequins? And the next question, if, if I can read you two questions, the next one is from Marilyn, who says, thank you so much, Dr. Mansour, on a very good presentation and call to action. I remember asking you at your last presentation what I could possibly do as an architect to help. And your call to action today provides such an avenue. I would be happy to volunteer. So if, if you could... Uh, uh, probably comment on these, and thereafter I'm going to request Rotarian Anuja to kindly uh, unmute and ask her questions. So the mannequins are, in a way, very much designed by artificial intelligence. So you have a heart balloon with arteries. It pumps remotely controlled, so you, it can pump faster to give you tachycardia, pump slower. The lungs are inflated by some airbags, artificially controlled, you can breathe fast or slow. And so when you do angioplasty, for example, coronary artery, you are really going through the artery of the mannequin all the way to the heart artery while it's pumping. And you are doing this with the same instrument that you do it in a patient. So there are, and I think probably it costs at least a couple, I think five or $6 million for some of the enterprises that we have in Karachi, the same thing will be used here. So today, most medical schools have one or the other, but having an innovations lab which virtual reality, it can really help define and train individuals. For example, robotics. You know, when we do robotic surgery, you are here at the console, your arm is where, the, where you're going to the patient about five feet away, and you are playing with this console here where, while that little robot does its thing. So you can do everything far away, far apart from the patient. But it takes, 120 robotic surgeries for somebody to say, I am proficient. And how many patients will jump ship on you before you get that proficiency? So this simulation labs allow to do that, but there is, there is technology to be able to do that. Uh, the last question was about... That was from the architect. Yes, the architect. There are many ways where you can help us. In fact, if you come to visit the CRU, there is a connection between mind and body that helps the patient in architecture, the built environment, as the chances always say, is really how we perceive our environment and how it makes us feel. So if you come one day, you can help us design the place here, but more importantly, you can volunteer for our COVID vaccine as well as for the fit test. Thank you so much. And now I'll request Rotarian Anuja. Uh, Anuja, if you can kindly unmute and ask your questions to Dr. No. Hello, uh, Dr. Mansour, and thank you so much for your presentation. Very interesting, very wide ranging um, subjects that you touched on and brought up so many questions. So I've had to prioritize my questions. Um, 
two things that I picked up which really sort of shook me. One was uh, the genetics idea and the presentation of the slides that you showed where, um, you know, you said that Kenyan women in a breast cancer situation, I think, these are women who already have breast cancer, you showed genetic activation that looked different from the women in uh, um, the African American women and Caucasian women, I assume they're from America as well. Um, and that was very startling. You know, I'm somebody who advocates very much for a global South approach to sociology and economics and international business. So I appreciate that approach. However, it's really shaken me to, to think that genetically regional differences, because it can't be racial if it's Afro-American and African, because they must be similar. Um, that's what the G, the hereditary, whatever program is, the genetic program for identifying hered her hereditary genes tells us. Uh, they identify things like that. So that's one question. I'm just, I'd like you to expand on that a little, just for my clarity. And then the second thing that I picked up on is, and you mentioned it in just a very short sentence, you said we're expecting a spike in COVID. And so um, these two questions are things that hit me, but there are a lot of other questions on that. And thank you so much for your presentation. It really was uh, very thought provoking. Thank you. Um, I'll take the easy one. We know around the world that this virus is not gone as yet. Uh, we may be somehow not immune to it, but we have a younger population, etc. But we are learning more that we have many more silent carriers who are asymptomatic who spread this. And there's no question that the South African or the British variant is here somewhere. It's more infectious or virulent. So I think while we look at the numbers at AKU, which reflect the numbers in other hospitals, which reflect the population are going down, I think most individuals and most predicted models will say that we will get a spike. Uh, maybe a small spike, but a much more little spike. If you look at, and I'll give an example from Tanzania, where there is some um, amnesia about COVID, but when Tanzania had a bad uh, bout of it, when we would have a bit of a bad bout as well, out of 100 patients, 70 were getting oxygen steroids and 30 were in the ICU, just by percentage. Today, with their spike today, the numbers are lower, but 70% are in the ICU, 30% in the unit who just need oxygen. So we are seeing the same thing can be reflected here. Fewer patients, but sicker patients. So clearly the biology of the virus or something's different. And I think it's a matter of time before we see a surge. So I would not give up on masking and social distancing, although our bubbles are getting to melt together. So that's one. Genetics, I think, and to just give an example, you know, we took tissue from East African women, took it to Alabama, hoping that it would inform the African-American gene. Well, I did a mistake. Geographically, East Africans are not the ancestors of North American African-Americans. It is the West Africans that are the uh, ancestors of North American African Americans. So I should have taken the West African patients. We have a study going on now to get their genes. But yes, it is clear that we can find ancestry by gene by genes, and we are different in our gene pool. Even Bantus are different than other Bantus because of uh, other factors. But more importantly, when it comes to cancer, it is clear that certain genes that we possess affect how we metabolize drugs, as well as how the predilection for risk of disease is for us. And there are many models to do that. And the reason to do what I did was just to tell big pharma, before you sell our drugs to us, you open our markets to your product. Fund us to do studies on our patients so that we may learn from it. For example, Eldomet is a drug for high blood pressure uniquely suited for the African-Americans in America who have the high blood pressure. Eldomet is not beneficial for the Caucasians because of genetic differences. So I think there's a whole slew of a talk I could give on that, which is why 
these are the slides I use to farm you to tell them, really study us before you let our markets be open to your drugs. Thank you so much, Dr. Manzur. That gives me great clarity and uh, much food for thought, actually. Uh, for somebody who deals with race relations, faith relations, and the dis differences between people and trying to bring them together, you know, this genetic difference that you're identifying, even in the way we respond to drugs and uh, different um, illnesses, is a fascinating subject. Thank you so much for bringing it to our attention. Thank you very much indeed, Rotarian Anuja, and uh, thank you, Dr. Mansoor. We have some more comments. Uh, they're actually comments. Uh, Dr. David Kitanga really enjoyed your presentation and says, great presentation, Dr. Mansoor. And many club members uh, have written in to say that they really benefited from the talk today. We have Dr. Manu Chandaria, uh, who has raised his hand. Uh, Dr. Manu Bhai? Uh, uh, Dr. Mansoor, we enjoyed your uh, uh, your discussion and uh, presentation. It's very really difficult for laymen to understand all this. Well, I hope you that uh, we can find some solutions because uh, the third biggest killer in East Africa, uh, you know, we've got to really make sure that we try to find answers uh, to that. Thank you for your wonderful speech. Thank you. I appreciate this. You know, I'm new to Kenya, but wherever I go, I see your last name. I have no clue who this man was, but now I've seen him at least on virtual reality. I think your voice speaks volume as a both humanitarian, but also a philanthropist, but also the one who has put his voice and his funds to meet specific needs. I think either through the Rotary or otherwise, if Dr. Manu Chandraya, uh, Chandraya says, this is important, people listen. So even if you may not have understood everything I said because I speak fast and my technology is maybe different than what you are used to, but knowing that you found this important, knowing that you would provide support for the work done by Rotarian, but also independently would be very helpful to us because people listen to what you say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, um, we will be moving to a close. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Doctor, for your time. And we are very grateful for this very informative talk and presentation. And in closing, I'd like to uh, read out uh, the clubs which were present with us today. Uh, if I think that before you start, so I will have Innocent send you a note. If there's an interest on Rotary, Nairobi, or Rotary as a whole, so we can plan to have this colon cancer screening. I'll give more information, but it will be useful if you have an interest because we are going to approach big uh, international conglomerates to, the, to have a good sample size. But I think it would be a good thing to do for at least a team of informed individuals. If you can participate, I would think others will listen as well. So I will have innocent follow up to see if there's a real interest on part of Rotary for the colon cancer screening map. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Doctor, and uh, we will definitely uh, uh, participate. I see our, uh, our Vice President Ambassador, Dr. Josephine, is also in agreement because uh, she's actually chairing the health initiatives for the district. Uh, so um, there, there is quite a bit of uh, interest, definitely. And uh, Vice President Mohammed Ali, if you can kindly unmute, and uh, there was an announcement, we can have the late announcement. Vice President Mohammed Ali, Rahmatullah. Right, I think uh, he, he has a problem with the mic, but uh, since we are talking about health today, and uh, the presentation today was all about taking care of ourselves and uh, our health, uh, as, as all the club members know, uh, Vice President Mohammed Ali is a champion at uh, holding uh, walks at Karura Forest. So this Sunday, all the Rotarians who are uh, interested, kindly contact uh, Past President Muhammad Ali Rantullah or Dr. Beatrice, and they will guide you on the time and uh, location. I think it's the Limuru entry of Karura Forest. Uh, do enjoy your walk and um, have
have a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. With that, um, we'll close the meeting. Today we had with us uh, uh, visiting Rotarians from Rotary Club of Rakif, Largo de Paz in Brazil, who tuned in to listen to this very informative talk. Welcome, A.G. Roberta. Thank you for being with us. And um, we also had members from Rotary Club of Kisumu Mashariki and Rotary Club of Nairobi uh, Madaraka, as well as uh, Rotarians and Rotaractors from other clubs. So with that, um, yes, and uh, one more note uh, from past president Muhammad Ali. Please do not forget past president Ashok Shah is also a keen walker too. Yes, yes, he is. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if we can raise a toast, if you have something to drink, kindly raise a glass. Alternatively, hand to the chest. And this is to Rotary the world over. Thank you. The meeting is officially closed. Doctor, thank, thank you. you so much. I appreciate it.